From the Mecca Mormonism, Salt Lake City, this is Heart of the Matter, where we are learning how to walk as Christians in the age of fulfillment. You'll notice the past uh, shows, we're doing some interviews and uh, visiting people that, you know, have been on the show before maybe, or uh, people you're familiar with. My guest tonight, a dear friend, a, br a longtime brother. He even uh, was the uh, moderator of uh, some debates here, did a fine job there. Uh, but you haven't met, you don't meet many people like Mark Pazant uh, or his wife, Casey. Uh, very unique, extremely informed, very capable people. And they want to get to the bottom of stuff in their life. I've noticed this about them. Uh, we don't hang out too much unless uh, we go to dinner and he makes me pay for it. <laughs> but... <laughs> We have a great story between each other about that. <laughs> yes, we do. But, uh, you know, we, we, socially we don't do too much. He's busy, I'm busy. But in terms of the faith, we have a lot in common. We talk at times about it, and we've gone a similar path. So I wanted to catch up with Mark, and I really think it's important that you hear where he came from, what he's been through, where he is now, and then some other things that will come up. If you talk to Mark, these other things come up, and we're not going to be able to get around it. But we begin, <laughs> with, the word, we give, we begin with the word of prayer. So uh, mm. I'll be the Pope. Lord, uh, we pray your spirit will be with us, Mark and I, as we talk about uh, your kingdom, this world, life in it, uh, and everything that comes up. We just pray that you will uh, have a, a spirit of enlightenment and uh, you'll be able, Mark will be able to articulate the things that you want him to say and I'll be able to respond in kind. And we just pray for Seth and, and Mags and Wendy at getting this program out and the people who will benefit by it now and in the future in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. One thing I uh, do want to say, uh, starting off, is I can't remember. So, Brother like Mark, it. tell us. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, thanks for coming. It's been a great, great to see you. It's yeah. always great. This, I mean, this guy has taught me more, hands down, about religion, understanding God than than anybody. Uh -huh. he's, he's a wealth of knowledge, uh, and uh, I'm. I'm privilege to have him as a friend and that's that's the truth that's saying a lot uh, mark coming from you um so just tell our audience believed to a degree we had the picture of jesus and mm. you know but uh but didn't practice you know I, I always i think i told you this before i've always i was always a believer for whatever reason mm. i always felt god in mm. and when i was fast forward up when i was a teenager um I made, a, I made an agreement with God one day. I was coming home and things weren't a little scary. I was a kid and, you know, I just told him that, you know, whatever, I'm yours. Wow. And, uh, and, and the thing that, that makes that stand out is I remember it as if it were yesterday. I think we went over this the last time yeah. uh, that you and I spoke. And, uh, and I remember, I remember right where I, wa uh, right where I was. And, uh, About how old? I was probably 11 or 12. Isn't that amazing? That and he stuck with you? Oh, it stuck with me. Night and day. I mean, wow. I, could, I could tell you, and, and I, I, I can recollect that at any time. It was, huh. it, was, it was monumental to me in where I am today. Wow. Uh, because there was no, um, I wasn't seeking. I didn't know. I didn't understand. I didn't have a background, you know, but I just knew. And, you know, I asked him to come into my life. Wow. And uh, my wife, similar. Yeah. Was um, that God or Jesus? Not that it matters. Well, so I didn't know the difference yeah. at the time, honestly. And, and, you know, really to me, there's, there's no difference today. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, but still never pursued, but always, always believed. I always tried to live a godly life, mm. you know, for what that meant. Mm -hmm. um, fast forward, way forward. Uh, I was thumbing through the stations one day. and Before just, you get to that, do you have oh, brothers? I do. I have it two says, brothers. Two brothers? Any sisters? Uh, interesting, yes, but not at the time. Oh, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> so wait, we're, I kind of just get the idea that you were the Pazant brothers, that in the community you would be the Pazant. No. I, have I got that wrong? No, oh, okay. we were not. I had, I had three brothers. My older brother died in 74 in a car accident oh. and we weren't close. We weren't a close family. Oh, wow. I was probably closer with my Younger brothers, um, but not not really close. My two younger brothers ended up moving with my mom to Cal. Let me back up just a little bit. 
My mother and father got divorced when I was very young after my, my so I had an older brother and then, then me, and then my mother and dad got divorced and they got back together and we had two more brothers. Mm. And then uh, after my older brother died, my mom moved to California. She hated the whole LDS thing and mm. everything it was about. My two younger brothers moved with my mom. Got it, got it. And that was 75 probably. And I moved with my dad at that time. We, nice. we were living with my mother in Murray. I moved to Cottonwood Heights with my father, my other two brothers. So not, we've never had a close family. The reason I uh, say that, just we probably won't go strictly chronological here because Mark, doesn't, we, we move around, but uh, you have not met a guy more uh, engaged with men. This guy is like the man's man. He's gonna he's gonna mock everything I say. He's the <laughs> this guy is like Who the knew? poster boy for man. I mean, he's he makes motorcycles from scratch. He does everything right. He goes on like cross country road trips for weeks at a time in the burning sun on these things with groups of guys. He's in the gym staying fit as hell. He's got a bunch of, in, in the church. He's had friend men group. He, he's a man's man. So I, I just thought that was part of your makeup maybe in the family, but no. No. Yeah. Wow. No, it's funny. So I'll just touch on that and then we can get back. The motorcycles is what God, God has given me for my ministry today. That's, that's what I use. That's the catalyst. Mm. I bring people together. Every bike I build has a scripture on it. Mm. And, uh, wow. and, and we pray on the road. And it's interesting to watch people observe us. When they see a bunch of guys get together mm. uh, and we're on bikes and they see us pray, they'll come up and comment. They'll ask us to pray for them. It's really, God has really done a really cool thing wow. with me through that. Wow. Wow. It's phenomenal so. how ministry just breaks, just breaks all the barriers. It does. Yeah. God uses what your tool are, mm -hmm. what, whatever tools he's given you mm -hmm. to, to work for him. Wow. And by the way, the name of the make? The bikes Out that I do? Yeah. So well, I don't know if I want to say if we're going to get into politics. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to lose half your audience. <laughs> Pro yeah, I'll probably run over outside. <laughs> so yeah, we'll just you, we'll, okay. We're we'll, not we'll saying. We'll steer clear any any. We're just steer clear of that. <laughs> so we'll I see just, if we stay out of politics, then we'll come back. <laughs> all right, all right, good. We'll run a commercial for several things that you do. So uh, you go, fasting forward, you're watching TV. Okay, so my brothers, two brothers, I had three, two, non-religious, uh, never been religious. I've certainly shared, anybody that knows me knows, you're going to hear about God if you talk to me. Hmm. And no interest. Um, my stepmother was, oh, it's probably been five, six, seven years ago, um, had uh, uh, a heart attack and uh, was dying. She had COPD. She had a... And I had an opportunity to go share the, so this kind of gets choppy and I'll, I'll try to keep it so that it's understandable. She was in the hospital, uh, she died momentarily. And when she came back, she was in fear of death. Wow. In mortal fear of death, which was the opportunity for me to go share the Lord with her. Fascinating. And I did it for, probably two or three months. I would go over at least once a week and we would discuss the Bible and Christ and, and uh, the sinner's prayer. And she had a, a friend over there that wasn't a believer and, 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 and I hope it gave her comfort. Huh. She, was, she was afraid to die. Huh. And so, and I was kind of new. Um, I remember when this and happened. And still learning. And mm -hmm. it was a good opportunity for me to learn. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, you know, um, I think it was meant to be. Wow. So fast forward, I'm watching TV, I'm thumbing through the uh, channels and this crazy guy comes on. I'm like, what the heck is this guy doing, right? And oddly enough, it was fascinating to me because I'd never really been a watcher of religious shows or I've never really cared, honestly. And, uh, and I'm watching you and I started watching you every week. Mm -hmm. And you started talking about a church down the street from where Casey and I lived that we would always considered going to but never, never had. And uh, I'll well, back up just a little bit. Casey and I were married by a, a pastor at the Christian church. Hmm. We, we didn't really go there a lot. My wife took the kids there a little bit. But, uh, but so we were believers. Both hmm. of us were believers, but we were of the mindset, you know, you start going to church, you gotta be better. You gotta, you know, dress up. You gotta act better. 
you got to be more, you know, the, the whole, it comes with this whole yeah, yeah, yeah. litany of all these Culture. requirements, right? That now you have to change who you are and we weren't ready to do it. <laughs> so, but uh, we were at a baby blessing at a Mormon church of a friend of ours and we stopped at this church on the way back and we'd never been to a Christian church and, and we didn't even know what to think. We were, we were in awe when we walked out of there. Wow. It was a piece of crap church, hmm. literally piece hmm. of crap. Hmm. And I thought, if God's not here, he's nowhere. Wow. There's no other reason to be here, none. Wow. Hmm. I mean, the roof was leaking. It, it was really pathetic. Wow. I loved it. Oh. I loved it. Casey loved it. And then we started going to campus within a week or so after that. Hmm. And we were going there and we were going to campus. Hmm. And we did that until, until you moved down here. In fact, we were still going there, right? Hmm. Yep. You, we uh, were going. You were going up to the U. Yeah. And then we moved down here, and uh, we embarked on a discussion in our campus teachings. That your wife said something profound to me. She said, "If what you're saying can be proven true, I'm never stepping foot in the church again." <laughs> that's, that's a that's a true statement. It is a true statement, and she stuck to it. What was that topic? Preterism. Preterism, which is defined as fulfillment of everything in Scripture. Now, there are different types of preterism. There's partial preterism, and a lot of people are partial preterists. But full preterism, which is what I am and which Mark and Casey are. I don't believe in partial. <laughs> he doesn't believe in partial. So it's, it's like it doesn't even exist? Not to me. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's just my take on it. Yeah. But I got to tell you, before we talk about preterism, uh, this guy and his wife... They're not like passive participants in things. They are hardcore investigators in things. They search, they read, they prepare themselves for whatever they're involved in. It's not just, it's really, that's their way. And, and they do some other things outside in their ministry and, and his wife has a ministry too and they do all those things. And they do not do things like half-ass at all. And so when it came to this topic, I mean, it was page turning and checking. Oh, I remember that. I remember when he told me, I said, you picked the wrong guy. Yeah. You picked the wrong guy. I'm going to prove you so wrong. Yeah. Right. And I dove in. He dove like from a 30 foot cliff dove and stayed underwater for, I don't know how long, uh, how long were you at it? I don't really remember, but I know after that, when the light finally came on, it really changed my life because I was as diehard a futurist as there could be. You could not convince me that we weren't waiting. You could not. That's all I knew. That's all I had taught, that I was taught. That when I read the Bible, that's how I, I interpreted it. And when you brought that up, and I just, you, what you have to do really, you have to just shut off your mind and you have to go back in and read it with an open mind that this, could this be real? And when you read that with that mindset, looking through that window, it all falls into place. Mm. In fact, my wife and I were both, we were dumbfounded that we were so ignorant, <laughs> seriously, that we didn't see these, all these signs mm. that preterism uh, uh, it unveils. Mm. What do you, what is, let's talk about that for a second because it is mind blowing that you kind of do see what you're looking for and you won't see what you refuse. You can't. You it, cannot. You can't see it. And it's, it's out of ignorance, in all fairness. It's it, not that I wanted to interpret the Bible as a futurist. Hmm. It's all I knew, so I couldn't allow my mind to see anything else. Hmm. But when you go back in and, and you say, hey, it's done. Okay, so let's, let's read it. Let's read some scriptures and see what that looks like if it's done. And you're like... That makes so much more sense now. So is that your recommendation to somebody who uh, d denies this whole thing and doesn't want to hear it? If you want the truth, you've got to shut off what you've learned and just read it as if it's possible. You, you definitely do. And that, that's probably easier said than done. Oh, yeah. To just go in totally unbiased and start from scratch, is, it's a hard thing to do. And in and, and all fairness, when I first went in, I didn't. Because I went in out of spite. <laughs> I went in Love I went guy. in to say, this guy's wrong, and I'm going to show him he's wrong. Yeah. And as I went in, I'm like, okay, let's, let's go back and forth. And I'd read, I'd read the scriptures both ways, and I'd say, okay, 
let, let, I kind of made a menu, okay? What makes more sense? What makes more sense? We've been waiting and waiting and waiting and we're waiting for him to come and it's 2,000 years. And, you know, what is this cataclysmic thing that we're waiting for that's going to trigger it? And when you go in, and for me, it was studying eschatology. If you study eschatology, it's all right there. I mean, I don't even think you can have an argument against it. It would yeah. be a tough debate. I would never want to be on the other side. If you start in uh, Daniel 7, 12, mm. and you go from there, I mean, it's painted black and white in my, in my yeah. mind. And even then, it was hard to suggest that that's not what it was pointing out. Mm. When the power of the holy people is broken, the end will come. Yeah. All right, so what does that look like? How do we go back and make that that uh, God, we're still waiting for God. Mm. And that's tough. Mm. That's tough. When you take the whole narrative of eschatology, it paints a pretty, pretty powerful picture. Yeah. In my word. Yeah, it does. And so after a churning and Casey's churning with you. Oh, yeah. You guys are. God gave me the perfect wife. Mm. Honestly, honestly, mm. we we have been side by side all the way through religion. Mm. We probably never disagreed in any part of it. Mm. We probably had understanding differences here and there, but uh, we're on the same page the whole time. Mm. So you're along the same page, you're going through, and then you, you, you come to see it, and then, and then what begins to happen? <laughs> and this is really important. You can't see his face maybe because of the hat. He just went like this. <laughs> it's hard. It's why? So I shared with my group, right? Is that another church that they're really active in and participated in? You yeah, share so with this, them? This group was even the group that was coming here with Mike oh, and Rick okay. and all those guys. And, and uh, I think Mike told me, if that's true, then what's even left to live for? And he shut down. Wow. He shut down. I, I think that was the end of it for him. Wow. And, and some people... Not only do they not want to hear it, they, they're not ready to hear it. Mm. Because there is a hope that I think, and it's a false hope, unfortunately, that we're waiting for Christ to come. Mm. And that when he comes, everything's going to be better. And so you push off everything in your life. Hey, you know what? God's going to be here, and it doesn't matter what I do. He's going to be here, and everything's going to be great. And when you take that away, it's, it is a hopeless feeling. It really is. Because you, it, and it's a lack of understanding, really. So what is, the, what is the healthy understanding as a preterist? Well, so for me now is um, it's done. Uh, my wife and I are closer to God now than we've ever been. Mm. And, and that was the trigger. That was the mechanism that did it. There is no more of this nonsense, mm. right? Go out and focus. Love. Mm. Really, at the end of the day, go love. Quit, mm. quit making excuses. Quit wait, making, you know, blaming the pastor. What, whatever your excuses are, just go love your neighbor. Do the best. We're not perfect, uh, but it gets all that stuff, all the junk out of the way in my in my. But can you get estimation. to that point that you and Casey arrived at without going through all the, the jungle before you come to the clearing? I couldn't, and I don't believe my wife could because we're systematic. Okay. That's just the way I work. Yeah. Right, and, 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 and I've shared this with you before. Without the whole study of futurism, I probably couldn't be where I'm at. Wow. Because it gave me a baseline. It gave me a good understanding. It did give me an understanding of Christ and how Christ, and Christ works a lot of different ways in our lives. And I'm, I wouldn't even say that futurism is bad. Yeah. If it's futurism or no Christ, I'll take futurism every day. Got it. Got it. Um, people do a lot of good stuff. And, so not and, a hill to die on in terms of uh, division. You know, I would say, and I've told you this before, and it's tough to say because I'm not wired this way, I'm reluctant to share preterism because it takes a strong will and somebody that, um, if you're fragile in the religion, um, and what I mean by that is, is if it's, it's dramatic for you and certain little things impact you, preterism's not for you. Yeah. You gotta be tough. You know, most people, I believe, don't search in truth and spirit. Right. They go listen to the Word, and whatever the Word is that day is what they take until they get to their car and forget and go home. Got it. This is not for the lighthearted. This is tough stuff. Mm -hmm. But if you are truly searching for God and you're doing what you should be doing, um, you're ready. You need to find it. Got it. You need to at least assess 
And, and you have to assess for yourself. That's what I got out of it. That's what I believe is true. Mm. Um, but <laughs> the one thing it's taught me is I can be wrong. Mm. After, mm. I mean, I read the Bible back and forth dozens of times, mm. dozens of times. And I was a futurist mm. and I was wrong. Mm. So it actually humbles you. Wow. Right? And I don't take a hard line stance probably on anything anymore if I'm arguing or debating because I love to. Um, and the reason I love to is if you think you know something, go up against somebody that knows just the opposite mm -hmm. and you'll find out in a big hurry mm -hmm. how much you really know. Mm -hmm. But what it's taught me is, is we can be wrong. Sure. And so I will argue if I'm taking a side, it's usually my argument is that you can be wrong. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm arguing that side to say, hey, I see. there's a possibility you're wrong. Not that I'm right. I'm not right. Okay. But you can be wrong. Got it. So, Mark, the balance that I'm hearing from you right now is that, on the one hand, you won't or you're reluctant to share uh, fulfillment, eschatology, preterism with people because it's like giving a child fire. It, 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 there's a responsibility that comes with giving it to somebody, and they have to be able to take manage it and handle it because if it does it will burn them and and it could destroy them it turns more people away than brings closer to god in my estimation yeah it, it turns believers it, away it shouldn't yeah but it does yeah but on the other hand of that is the fact that once it's understood and embraced and seen it's liberating like nothing else the one thing that it truly does is it is very liberating, but it, it requires a ton of accountability now. Yeah. And people don't want that. Yeah. It's amazing that people do. They want to have somebody else be the fall guy for them. Oh, it's so important. And if you don't have the accountability, it, you can't do it. How does it make you accountable? Well, you're not held to that anything. It's done, right? And now God just said, here you go. You're my child. Yeah. Go, nobody's going to be there holding your hand anymore. And uh, but do you mean that like the Holy Spirit will be there? Or no, no, no. Uh, I'm just clarifying. The and so, and so, yeah. This starts getting really complicated because you're anti brick and mortar, and I agree with that philosophy. But the brick and mortar is really the glue that's that keeps futurism together. And if that's the religion you've been brought up on, and that's your, that's your motive, of, uh, motive of teaching and understanding, and you remove that, it's who's there? It's Got all it. on you now. It's, Got it. It's all the accountability is on you now. Got it. There's, there's, no, there's no business. There's no team. There's no people to call and hotlines backing you up. It's just you. All that responsibility is just you. It's done. Mm. God is, God's done right and 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 we're not waiting and we're not working together and and now it's just time to grow up got it right what is the hebrews it says you know quit quit drinking milk grow Move up on. be an adult forget yeah. all this placing hands and all this stuff you should be a teacher you should be out there bringing people mm. quit being a baby mm. and really that's a quantum leap that's what preterism Such does that's a quantum an leap. important point it really is and so just, just to qualify my stance against brick and mortar is that it is now fully developed and it's couched in my eschatology. You make a great point that I haven't considered that if you're a futurist and your eschatology is he's coming back, the glue is brick and mortar religion. It is. Yeah. And those, those religions do good. They are beneficial to the community. They add fellowship, things like that. I just worry about them becoming that uh, a, a breeding ground for non-thinking. I agree with you 100% on why you're anti-brick and mortar. Yeah. I do. Yeah. But I just don't feel like our, the base, the Christian base, mm. is mature enough to, to do without it. Mm. They're not. So is, in your estimation, a way that we can get, we can move the, the faith to be more mature or does it have to go through these phases in your estimation? I don't think they want to be. I think the seekers mm. seek mm. and the rest are followers. Mm. So that responsibility that you're talking about says to Mark and Casey, hey, we're going to get up and we're going to be loving today and we don't have the, the, we don't have the, the fear of Jesus coming back tomorrow and we're going to make our lives fruitful and we're going to choose to do that. We are 
going to allow God to work through us without any pastoral oversight. We are choosing, and that's the responsibility you're, you're talking about. I would say, yeah. I, I mean, so, you know, my wife, my wife is as loving as it gets. She spends a lot of time with children. She brings a lot of children to Christ in a very tough environment. Uh, you know, the, the dominant religion here has some pretty tough beliefs, and they don't like anybody infringing in that. And my wife's not afraid to, to bring you to Christ. Mm -hmm. And she does a lot with kids. And these kids follow her. She'll work with, with uh, you know, five, six, seven-year-olds. And when they graduate, they invite her. When they get married, she's invited. They're in her lives forever. Mm. And it's because she's not afraid to share uh, God in there and, and bring that. Totally to separated from organized religion. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and, so it's, and so is your ministry. So what I would say, rather than separated, is it's, it's, um, it's brought to the, to the person in need on a personal level. It's not, we don't have to go find the church or the pastor or the, the bishop. It's there in every day. Mm. Every day, hey, I'm struggling today and my wife can, can use application of Christ. Hey, mm. you know, God forgives you mm -hmm. and, and just put it to practice in, mm. in real terms rather than going and sitting and, and listening to somebody regurgitate, mm. the actual put it to terms, mm. right? Yeah. It's like going to school and learning, mm. right? Um, rather than just taking in, uh, actually using it and putting it into a, a person's life. And, mm. and uh, it's hard to describe. Yeah. But. So in addition to the uh, full-blown, you know, freedom, you know, as Sartre said, we are condemned to be free. You're going to have to make your choices, be responsible. Uh, what other difficulties, what other downsides have been the result of full preterism that you completely embrace? What, what other things have been difficult for you as a, as a believer? Because I'm preterist, yeah. nobody wants to be your friend. <laughs> What do you think they mean when they say full preterism is dangerous? I hear that, read that online. It's, it's a dangerous heresy. Do you think that they're talking about the d disillusion of brick and mortar? You know, I don't know. Oh. I, I, I haven't heard that. Oh. I know people don't want to hear it. You know, I've been involved in other churches and I know it's, it's frowned upon. And I've sat down with the, the, the heads of the church and had conversations and said, hey, show me where I'm wrong. Here's the scripture uh, that I'm using. Show me what you're using. And we would agree to disagree. I think it, it would be hard to be a pastor of a, a preterist church mm. with the typical Christian. Mm. Um, it's not, you know, I, when you look at Mormonism and Catholicism and all that, it's, it's structured to control. Mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately, I think that's where people are comfortable. I see. I'm not. Yeah. My wife's not. Yeah. And so I want to be free in Christ. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be free for you to tell me what I need to do in Christ. And we look at a lot of religions today, and even what's going on in our messed up world today, I don't think religion is there to help people work through these challenges. Mm. It's actually a stumbling block in many ways. Mm. Um, I don't believe preterism is. Mm. I have faith in Christ, you know, and, 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 and only Christ. Yeah. I don't need the religion. Yeah. I, I direct people to religion because if you don't have it, you need, where is the faith, where is the hope today without Christ? Mm. If you look there at what's going on in this world, where is hope without Christ today? Right. If you didn't have, I can't even imagine not having Christ in my life today. Mm. and having to deal with the things that we are, we're confronted with today. Mm. And so taking that comment, it, and we, you and I have said this a couple of times laughingly, it's almost like we wish we could be futurists uh -huh. because this world is so screwed oh. up. Oh. It seems like he's coming back to destroy it because it doesn't uh -huh. seem like we're going to be able to salvage no. where we're headed. No. In so fact, what do you I think I brought that? that up to you the other yeah. day. I, I, wish I, were, I wish I were a futurist yeah. right now because... If it, if, if I believed it, I would believe it's coming. Yeah. Right? I, right. It's knocking at the door. Yeah. But uh, it is like right here. Oh, my. <laughs> so then what's happening then in your mind with the, I mean, it's almost, it just seems like in the past 10 to 20 years, we have unraveled. Yes. It, it, we've just unraveled with anything that has to do. 
what do you think if the world's not going to end and there isn't going to be Jesus coming to take his bride and wipe the rest of us out, where are we headed? What's going on? And what's the solution? My, Mark, Mike, uh, I'm thinking of Mike, our friend. Uh, what's the solution? I don't have the solution. <laughs> it's only Christ personally. I mean, I don't know what else to say. Well, I mean, fortunately, I think we're both on the, the belief that, you know, when we leave, we'll, we'll, we'll leave this place and go to God. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but what about politics? Are politics the solution? Because you are... The, Mark and I differ greatly. Church and state stuff, I think we differ. I think we differ on a lot of heat solutions. And Mark, where we differ is I don't give a damn. He doesn't. Mark does. And he cares and he learns. So he is the antithesis to what Carl Moore was. If you took uh, Carl Moore, Native American, a few weeks ago, we have the exact opposite sitting here in Mark Pazant. I don't know that I'd go that far. <laughs> But oh, religion, I do. religion is the modern day Nero, in my opinion. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, politics. Politics. Politics is the modern day Nero. Wow. It is here to destroy and divide, and, and that's exactly what it's doing, in mm -hmm. my estimation. We are stomping Christ to dust in every way. We're removing Pledge of Allegiance, right? One nation under God, anything that says God or, or even suggests God uh, at least from the Democratic Party, is being stomped to dust. And in my opinion, the only reason for that is that we don't want the unity. We are a, a country of microcultures and tribalism today. Mm. And through that is chaos. There's no unity. And you can pretty much do whatever you want. And that's exactly what they're doing. Mm. You know, we're supposed to be uniting. when We're, we're talking about Let's do away with racism as we're creating more division, more racism, more separation, white privilege, blah, blah. It just goes, there's no goal in mm. unity here today. Mm. And without the, the, the true adhesive is Christ. Even the founding fathers understood that. Mm. Uh, I think I shared a, a, a writing from um, John Adams. He said, the Constitution was written for a moral and religious people. And paraphrasing, aside that, it has no application. Um, he understood, the Founding Fathers understood that God is the catalyst. God is the factor, the force that keeps us together as a nation. And, and you know, a, a nation divided will, will, will fall. And, and that's, that's where we're at. And, and the problem that, and it's not that I like politics or even want to be involved in politics, is politics affect you and I every day. And maybe not you on a personal level, but it affects this ministry. It affects how people can come. We were just talking uh, a little earlier about you've lost a First Amendment privilege if you're a 501c3, a nonprofit. Why is that? Why is that? Why do you lose a voice for God when we know that the government, the founding body of this government was pro-God? God is in every document, right? right? The Ten Commandments. All of that, the founding fathers seen the value in that. The government today, the, the politicians today see that as an adversary against them. Okay, you gotta help me because I, I'm not uh, well read. So you say that politics today is Nero. Yes. But you agree with the political stance of the forefathers who established and wrote the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, you agreed with politics or you agreed with government then? I agree with the Founding Fathers' concept of what they needed to provide for a structure. The Founding Fathers, in everything they've, that they have wrote, in my estimation, was to protect the people from the government. Hmm. If you look at all the Bill of Rights, those protections were to protect us from what's happening today. Hmm. And you can watch that be squandered and squelched away. So with... Carl, a few weeks ago, he was saying the government is the is the enemy too. You're saying the same thing. So, what is the is your solution from this perspective? If the government's the enemy, how what can we do? We we go back to classic liberalism where everyone is free and, and well, so we should be free under our you know under capitalism, right? I mean, that's what this country's founded on is freedom. Okay, we're losing that through the socialist transition we're losing them so look at free speech we have uh, groups of people that use free speech that have said they they were suppressed and 
they weren't able to use free speech, but they're taking that same First Amendment privilege and taking your freedom of speech away. Right, right. That you can't even talk about Christ. Hmm. Now, how does that... In the, church, in the church setting you're talking well, about. Well, in any setting today, I mean, you can't pray in schools anymore, hmm. right? We can't even do pledge allegiance to the flags. So you have the National uh, Football League, Baseball League, that can't uh, even uh, support the national anthem. I mean, we're going down this chaotic road that makes zero sense. But so many people d agree with you. Why is there this, this passivity to let this wet roll over us? That, that's what I don't understand. That's why that's I'm frustrated. I don't want to be involved in it, but I can see, not even for me, for my kids and my grandkids, we're teaching children at uh, third grade levels now about sex and fluid genderism. Hmm. How does that promote a country or help a, a student? I think we went from number one in the world, from educated, to I think we're 39 now. Wow. Um, uh, our graduation rates are, I think, at all-time lows. And so these are the people. Here, here's the problem, Sean, in my opinion. When the Founding Fathers established the government, it was people like you and I that would take a term off of our businesses, and we would go serve our country. Mm. We would go serve a term in the Senate or the Congress, and we would pass laws and legislation, and then we'd come back and we'd have to live under the laws of which we just created. Mm. We don't have that anymore. Uh. We have career politicians that are never held accountable for the laws they pass. Mm. And so when you go back and you, you create a law that limits religion and your voice, you're never gonna come back and have to deal with that. I see. You just stay there and, and you keep your agenda and your power, sure. and, and we've got a a power-hungry government that the Founding Fathers predicted would happen, mm. right? Mm. That's one of the biggest things today is the Second Amendment privilege. The Second Amendment wasn't given to us to protect so much from our house. It was to protect from the government coming, mm. a tyrannical government coming, taking our rights away. Mm. That's knocking at the door from what I see, mm. <laughs> right? We're losing those every day. Wow. And now you see with the cancel culture um, that's kind of stacked on the back, if, they, if somebody doesn't like this show, yeah. they'll come and destroy your business. Mm. They'll stomp out every one of your contributors. Mm. And, uh, and that it just doesn't make sense to me. How does that help anyone on any side of, real, of the government, regardless of what party you're in? So the passivity is probably due to fear. You know, COVID was a great example of what fear can do. Mm. Ooh, you're just touching on all the bases. Let's hear it. I just call it how I see it. I mean, uh, could Did you ever, if, if, if two years ago I would have told you that the government would have the ability to shut down all of our businesses, mm -hmm. you would have said I was insane, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They did it w with no pushback, zero pushback. Mm -hmm. We have bankrupted more businesses mm -hmm. because of a supposed, and I'm not suggesting that, that COVID's not real, mm -hmm. but it's got a less than one half of 1% fatality ratio for the average person. Hmm. That's no more than anything else. Anything, okay. ever. We bankrupted the country hmm. because of that. As a means to bring us into socialism? I think that that's an argument that one could debate. Mm -hmm. Certainly for power. Hmm. For Certainly power. for power. There's, uh, there's some conspiracy theories out there, and I try not to get too involved in it, but if the first round, and, and so here's how you take power. First round is you, you get rid of the, the, the smaller businesses that aren't well-funded, and you can do that, which is what they've done. Then you give a little token out to them. Here, here's a check for 600 bucks, yeah. and you start that cycle, that welfare cycle. And then um, I've heard some estimates that uh, they're going to start depreciating the dollar, which when you start printing money, sure. that's a side effect. And what happens is now the next layer of business has money, but if they depreciate, and some estimates were 15% a year over the next four years. I've mm. heard some of those. Whoa. And, and whether that is or not, you know, do your homework. If you do that, now you depreciate the next layer of business owners. And before you know it, you've got your welfare class. And now you've got your socialism because you've just destroyed all the business. Mm. We're moving our businesses back overseas again, which we just fixed that. We were energy dependent. <laughs> just months ago, mm. we're back in OPEC. You can see our gas is a buck more a gallon. Mm. When it goes up a buck, it's not just filling your car. It's all your groceries. It's any hardware. It's everything you touch. Mm. 
So there's something going on. And if, if you had to make an argument, uh, like anything, you have to stack the dominoes up. And socialism is probably more probable than strengthening capitalism right. <laughs> when right. you look at the facts. So uh, I have to bring in what, where my interests are and where your interests are, too. And with all this, where's God and what's what's on the backs of those who want to resist these moves? Well, that's a tough, tough uh, order there. How do you resist it? Well, you, you get involved. I mean, we don't get involved. We, we all talk about being involved, but I don't think we do, whether it be going to church or whether it's yeah. in politics. If we didn't allow the people that are in politics to stay in politics, right? If it got back to the requirement where the people demanded that business owners went back and served, you mm -hmm. know, then mm -hmm. you could limit that. But we're, we're down a, a long... Are we too far gone? You know, if I wasn't a believer, and I'm just believing in Christ, that it's not important, <laughs> right, what happens here. Um, like I said, where's the hope without Christ? If I didn't have hope in Christ, I would be... Here's, here's the numbers. Here's, here's where the rubber meets the road. Suicides are up. Drug abuse is up. Alcoholism is up. Domestic violence is up. This is the side effect of what we're doing. Yeah. This is the side effect of not having Christ in your life, mm. in my estimate. Mm. Yeah, I'm right, right? on that. Yeah, they, we talk about all these solutions to making people happy and accommodate. And, you know, we can call uh, them them instead of he or she. And we're doing everything to make everybody happy. And they're all killing themselves. More and more people are right. killing themselves. And they're, they're convincing you that this is the right, right way. They're convincing us it's the right way. Right. I'm right with you on, on all that. But... How do we as believers bring Christ in as the solution without getting involved in the mire of, of this infighting and this, these politics and, and this, this ugliness? Here's the difference between you and yeah. I. And I understand where you're at and you should be where you're at. The problem that I have and the only reason I use politics as the vehicle is through politics, we're losing Christianity. No one's fighting for Christianity. Mm -hmm. And I understand where you're coming from. Christ didn't fight. But look, we have a responsibility. Mm -hmm. and, and whether or not uh, everyone's responsibility is to fight in a political sense, that, that's up to the individual. That's where God puts okay. on your heart. But if we just continue to let Christ be squelched away, the Ten Commandments, the Pledge of Allegiance, prayer, God, churches, we shut down churches under COVID. We shut down, that is the number one time in this history of this country we should have churches open, mm. that they can go and, 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 and we're not having mass suicide mm. and drug abuse because they have Christ in their life. Mm. And how you can shut down a church and people are okay with it is our problem, mm. right? Mm. And so we need to fight. And this is where I have a problem with the Republican Party. It, they're pushovers. Mm -hmm. The Democratic Party wants something. They, they steamroll it and they get it done. And, and the, the Republicans stand aside as God swept away, mm -hmm. as churches are closed. Where's our voice? Why do these? It, and why that's is where this? I'm frustrated. Do you know why this I is? I do not know. And I'm frustrated by it. Mm -hmm. When it comes into the legal system, which is where we are, when we have our courts that support these kind of things that, uh, that one thing, so you, you have the big acronym for the gay community and, and, and so, and I, I work with some lesbians and, and, and the lesbians that I work with are not for what the gay culture is today, mm -hmm. the parades and all that. They just, they it have is, their feeling and that's, and I knock yourself yeah. out and yeah. I'm, I'm fine with that. Yeah. Be whatever you want. Just, it's not my, my responsibility. You don't want to be a Christian. Right. Don't. I'm not going to jam it down your throat. Right. And so we're all, we're, we're back to this tribalism, right? We're all these little microcultures and we're fighting together. And then all of a sudden, the, uh, the transgenders want to compete with the women. And now all of a sudden, the lesbians are saying, hey, wait, just a minute. And now here we go. Here's our next division. We're always dividing into tribalism, mm -hmm. into smaller tribes. And I think that's by design. As long as we're distracted, 
They can take all of our stuff. They can take our churches. They can take God from us. They can take it all. And, and, and we're focused over here. We're not focused on the important thing. And that is we need the unity through Christ. Just out of curiosity, your opinion, is this orchestrated by uh, uh, certain powers or is this just a dark, is this darkness at work in the hearts of fallen man? Well, you know, I, I could certainly argue both ways. both ways. I mean, there's there's certainly some momentum behind this because, like I said, when you could go to jail for smoking weed today longer than a, a pedophile. Mm -hmm. Now, I just try to picture myself as a as a justice, and and I've got kids. I obviously have grandkids mm -hmm. somewhere. How does this benefit society? Mm. We're letting convicts out of prisons. Mm. We have. Uh, I remember during the State of the Union, the last president, we were talking about, he brought some families in, their, their, their kids had been molested and killed by repeat offenders of uh, illegal immigration. Mm. And no one was opposed to the people that were illegal and returning time and time again. And, and there was, there was no legislation. I'll tell you the worst thing, the worst thing I can think of today. Are you familiar with uh, Operation Underground Railroad? Tim Ballard, I believe, is the founder of it. No. We have a bigger slave trade today than we did back in the, in the days when the blacks. Hmm. And look at the momentum we have behind slavery. Yeah. Today is bigger than that. Uh, Tim Ballard with Operation uh, Underground Railroad works on children sex slave yeah. that is one of the biggest problems we have today and a lot of these people that are coming across the southern border are sent into the slave trade you'll never hear a word about that mm -hmm. if we truly care about society if we care about oppression or any why wouldn't we start with our children mm -hmm. and stopping these kind of things mm -hmm. Right? Mm, makes sense. And it's, it's unbelievable. If, if you ever have time, just go on and look at what he's doing. He's doing miraculous stuff. Mm. But how many people are brought in? We're one of the top few countries in the world today for children's sex. Mm, that's just disgusting. And it's, I can't even wrap my no, head around it. I can't either. You will never hear the media talk about it. You'll never hear legislators talk about it. And then you have the Jeffrey Epstein, you know, I killed myself in prison. You know, well, I mean, that's what happens. It gets swept under the carpet. Nobody cares, really, mm. right? When we look at all the things that we're fighting for, supposedly, to make the country a better place, nobody cares. Would we not start there? It's our children. I want to make a shameless plug right now for uh, fulfillment eschatology, and that is this. From my end, you're talking about your end and the things, and, and you make a convincing argument that something needs to be done. Well, if people who are most interested in stopping children from being sold as sex slaves would probably be people of faith. And it'd probably be everybody, but especially people of faith. So the only way to get people of faith to be motivated to do something in this world that's not going to be done away with is to remove the idea that Jesus is coming back to put justice on all these molesters right. and to put it back in your, your responsible hands. When people learn, hey, it's done, now as a Christian, what are you going to do? In fact, I would agree that if fulfillment was in the hearts and minds of the majority of Christians, then I would start talking about now get involved. Now get out there and start doing something to change. This is how futurism, I believe, hurts us. I agree. All right? And that's what I think lends to the apathy. Yeah. It's just, well, God's going to, you know. And God is not doing anything to stop it. No. It, it's, I mean, if it's, if it's a bigger problem today than it was during the black slave trade, I mean, what is God doing? Right. Well, and, and is that our excuse? Well, God should be doing this. He's, he's the God. It, it, I, that's Isn't not that an what excuse, we're here for? <laughs> but the doctrine has to back up why you would be involved to do something uh, and, and instead of just facilitating this idea that you really don't have an obligation because it's all going to be fixed in the future anyway and this world's not going to last. I don't know how anybody with any morals at all could feel that way, hmm. that you could turn your kids over to sex slavery because, you know, God will rectify it. And, yeah, well, <laughs> I, that extreme, I agree with you. How are we doing on time? 
50 minutes. <laughs> wow, we're in We've trouble. We've covered so much. <laughs> One other, th- two other things I want to bring up. And you talked, we've talked about the apathy that within the Republican Party, et, et cetera. We have some people who occasionally step in to campus. Uh, Patrick, he doesn't mind me mentioning him. He will come in. And Patrick is a guy who is out on the street and he is resisting everything from, I mean, free speech. You can't say that. He's renaming everything. There's gender fluidity. It's LGBTQ, everything. It's, this is Patrick. He comes in with such chutzpah. Uh, the guest we had, he brought it and he said, I'm going to put my flag up. He put, actually put a flag up behind himself. He did not pause. Is it because we're too polite? Is it because we're trying to give people some room to have their different views that we aren't as proactive and that the, the militant left is so irreverent and so impolite that they will stomp in and fart at a, in church and laugh at a funeral? Isn't that exactly what, what's happening isn't that exactly what they want? They want for them, but just not for you. Right. And I'm actually okay. Go do whatever you want. I am Be too. Be whoever you want. Put your flag wherever you want. Just leave me alone. Right. I am right I, with I you on that. I think that's where the typical Christian conservative is. Okay, so that's a problem though, because if we have a, hey, laissez-faire, do what you want to do, I will do what I want to do, classic liberalism, it doesn't work in this world anymore. No, no because they're, 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 they're taking away the first amendment. Ta- yeah. They go to colleges, and if a conservative speaker wants to show, or a Christian speaker, yeah. they'll beat you over the head. Yeah. And so the problem that I have with that is not so much, they have the right to do it, knock yourself out, uh, but we have legislation that protects them to do that, which is kind of anti-First uh, Amendment. So for you, it's at the legislative end that things have to change. Because well, so let's, let, you know, that's what perpetuates it. When we look at, so let's look at the last year when we had the BLM and Antifa shutting cities down, taking over, burning, looting, and, you know, and, and the government's allowing it. I remember here, who was our, our mayor, Jenny Wilson, who said, let's just let them go. We'll, we'll flip the bill later. And I'm like, well, Who's flipping the bill? She's not flipping. We're flipping the bill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why are we allowing that to continue on? Because once you let it go, they know it's going to snowball. Mm-hmm. If you stop it and you cancel it, then it will certainly die there. Right. But it, at that point, it seems like there's a, bigger, there's a bigger game behind this because I don't understand why a representative would allow that to continue. Mm-hmm. Why do they allow... Portland and Seattle to be mm. their downtown city was taken over. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And when the president said, Hey, I'm gonna send the garden, they're like, No, you're not. We're gonna sit Yeah. Where does that come from? What's you know? That drives me crazy. It, it drives you crazy. Does. This is the final question I have for you, Mark, and that is uh, you're you're a student of history. You you studied uh, all the secular historians when it came to preterism. Do you see what's happening here as what has happened in every major civilization over the course of human history. Absolutely. And so it really isn't going to be stoppable. It's going to happen. And it's unfortunate that we're alive at the time when we can see the major shift occur. But, you know, we're going to be another Europe. We're going to be another Rome. We're going to be another Greece. We're just going to go the way of civilizations when they start thinking they're so smart they don't need God. Right. Yeah. That's exactly it. Yeah. That's exactly the purpose, in my opinion. Yeah that we stomp God out. It's because uh, you get rid of the unity, you get the inner fighting, and no one's there to challenge you. Wow. And, and you're, you're spot on. When we look at, uh, like your, uh, Carl, uh, about the land here, I yeah. mean, he's, he's a believer in Christ. Yeah. Uh, he's had to have read the Bible. Yeah. You, Persia, Greece, uh, Russia, or, uh, uh, Rome, yeah. uh, Byzantines. Yeah. They never gave land back, right? <laughs> yeah. They mowed you down and killed you and, and, and yeah. you, know, you were slaves. Yeah. So you're right. That is our history. Why everyone chooses to pick on the U.S. today, you know, we're probably one of the only countries that have been attacked. And then we'll use Japan, for example. We're attacked. We go bomb them. Then we go rebuild their, their city. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, same with Europe. We go rebuild. We give land back. We don't keep it. I mean, we've certainly, you could argue that land has been kept, but... Man, if you look at uh, history, you know, uh, even with the with, with slavery, 
you know, if we're going to look at uh, uh, Africa, African Americans, uh, I'm pretty sure Egypt is in Northern Africa. Mm. Did they not enslave the Jews mm. <laughs> for a long time? Mm. I mean, so you can't get away from it if right. people just go back to whatever fits their, their agenda and then the rest of that history doesn't exist. Uh, you know, it, it would all be a better place if we all united and rather than the division that yeah. we have today, but it seems like everyone thinks that's the best option. Yeah. And, uh, and so uh, to bring it back to your point earlier, and I agree with you, uh, since this is a cyclical thing that civilizations do, since uh, the darkness just seems to relentlessly be more uh, aggressive to get dark in than light, and since this is the condition of the fallen physical world, our hope is Christ. Has to be. Yeah. It has to be. Preterist, futurist, the hope Regardless. has to be Christ. Yeah. And so sharing him in your own ministries, in your own life, looking to him, trusting in him, that's really the only solution the individual has in my estimation. Peace. Peace. That's peace. Yeah. Peace in the heart. Yeah. Right. And I'm so grateful for it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and, and in that, even though we have some differences, we unite as brothers straight across. And the thing that's beautiful is I think you, you unite and I unite with anyone who says Christ is, is the center, is the core, is the peace, the Amen. Savior. I yeah. mean, I even people that don't, I try to, yeah. you know, I'll take them out on the, we'll do, you know, a week, two weeks, whatever, out on the road. And, and you get some good opportunities to see how God works in your life. Wow. And, uh, you know, it doesn't happen every time. And it, it's not something that happens uh, uh, in a short period of time. It takes some time, but you can reflect back. And, and I try to have conversations with guys that we reflect back and you see how God hmm. played a role. So smart. And, uh, you know, it's there. It's, it's real to me. Hmm. Right. And, yeah. you know, once again, though, uh, believe, don't believe. That's up to you. I don't. I'm yeah. for freedom. Yeah. Me Hands too. down. I'm for freedom. Yeah. Right. At the end of the day, let's be free. Let's. You and I push Christ, and yep. if you don't want to listen, don't. Yep. Go do what you need to do, but don't step on Christ either. Yeah. Right? Uh, <clears throat> final thought. Uh, I've been trying to get this guy involved in office, but he's not going to join Nero. He's not going to join the beast now, so <laughs> that's not going to happen. But final thought to the audience. You, I mean, you, you bear a lot of wisdom. You have a lot of knowledge, but you apply it. What would be your final thought to the audience who will watch this now and then in the archives in years to come? Years to, I'm hoping nobody watches it years to come. <laughs> I don't like watching myself on here. Uh, you know, I don't know if I have any words of wisdom, but um, it, it seems as if we're losing Christianity as I see it. And I wish people would, people will take the time uh, you know, to learn any video game, a flavor of ice cream, a clothes, a shoe. Take some time and learn about Christ. What do you have to lose? Mm. You know, I used to tell my, uh, my stepmom before she died and her friends, I said, you know, uh, you know they would always challenge and people do, How, you know, what if Christ isn't real? I said, you know, if the worst thing that happens in my life that I've studied Christ and I believe I've become a better person and I'm wrong in the end, what have I lost? Mm. We have the time. Study Christ. It will change your life if you let it. Mm. And I wish people would just give them a better chance. Just a, 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 a little more time, right? A little. You'll spend all the time in the world for anything, but you won't spend the time just to learn about Christ. Mm. Great final message from a great brother. Thanks for taking the time. He didn't want to do this. I did. But I twisted, I'm horrible at it. I twisted his muscular <laughs> arms and I won. <laughs> we join, write your comments below and uh, join us next week here on Heart of the Matter.